This is my upgraded VAT heater, my resin 3D printer. I designed it to be quick and simple to use. Plug in the power, adjust the timer and target temperature if you need to, then press to start the heater. I normally give it 15 to 30 minutes to heat up the resin before starting the print. The heater will then continue to maintain the temperature until it reaches the timeout or you stop it. Here's one of the calibration models I printed. I think it came out pretty well. I've wanted to make an upgraded version for a long time, so when Next PCB reached out about sponsoring a video, it seemed like the perfect opportunity to do it. So thanks NextPCB for sponsoring this video. This video took way longer than I initially planned, but NextPCB have been so patient and absolutely wonderful to work with. This build is upon my old version, which you can see in my last video. The main changes I made were to create a custom control board, add an e-ink display, add a rotary encoder, and replace the camphor wire heating element with the PCB heating element. Heating the resin to an optimal temperature really helps the printing process. I don't think I've had a single failure that wasn't due to my bad supports since having my heater. So although the heater was functional, it was ugly and a bit inconvenient. I also thought it would be cool to release the design so that other people would be able to make one if they wanted to. The code, schematics, PCB design and CAD files will all be available on my GitHub repository. This video is going to mostly focus on designing the PCBs for the project. The first thing I need to do is decide on my design requirements so I know exactly what things I'm going to need to do. The improvements I want to make for my last design are to increase the PWM frequency above the human audible range, have a screen to display the status, have a way to input the target temperature and set a timeout, and shrink everything to fit inside the print enclosure. Oh, and uh, move the heating element wires away from the front of the vat. Let's not make that mistake again. I decided to create two PCB designs, one for the control board and one to act as the heating elements. I thought this approach would work well and give me a lot of flexibility. The heating element PCB would be very simple, just requiring a trace to act as the heating element, a thermistor and connection points. I did consider making this an aluminium PCB, but the more I thought about it, the less sense it made. It would have just added cost and made the design more complicated. With a standard two layer board, I could route the traces of the heating element on the backside where it'd be closer to the vat, meaning the thermal conductivity of the PCB was mostly irrelevant. The control board would be significantly more complex, as it needs to do a lot more. I decided to use an ESP32C3 microcontroller, because it's cheap, easily powerful enough for this application, has enough GPIOs, supports I2C, SPI, and has analog inputs. It also supports Wi-Fi, in case I decide to do any wireless stuff with it later. For the display, I picked a small e-ink screen. There were two main reasons for this, First, ink displays are just really cool, and secondly, I didn't want a display that was going to be giving off any light. I was concerned the backlights for the LCDs, or the light from the small OLEDs, might affect the resin if left shining on it for hours. They probably wouldn't, as they shouldn't really be giving off any UV light, but some of the spectrums can start to get close to the UV wavelengths, so why risk it? The last thing I needed to decide was the type of input I was going to have to control it. I thought a rotary encoder is one of the simplest, most versatile and standard choices for an input. I think that covers the main requirements, so now on to the actual designing of it. Designing a board like this involves breaking it down into different functional parts, then connecting them all together. Most ICs will have a reference design and design guidelines in the datasheets. If they don't, then I'll choose a different IC that does. I normally just follow the recommendations, but sometimes make adjustments if I think it will suit my design better. While the reference designs are normally good, there can be mistakes or better designs, so don't always blindly follow them. The size of the board wasn't critical, and it's a prototype, so I wanted the ability to be able to change components if necessary. So I used 0603 sized resistors, capacitors and inductors where possible. They're the smallest size I still find convenient to solder by hand. Once I have all the components selected and the schematic completed, I start on the PCB layout. I thought I could probably get away with doing this on a two layer board, so that's what I went for. There's so much that goes into creating a good PCB layout, and so many factors that affect every decision, I couldn't possibly hope to cover it all, so I won't. I just want to give an overview of my general process. Step 1. I start by grouping all the components that will be physically close together to each other. The groups will normally be similar to the schematic groupings. Step 2. Finish the layout. Here's the one I did earlier. 
I always like looking at the designs in 3D where possible, to check everything looks good and makes sense. It's very easy to forget that the components are three-dimensional and the heights can cause issues. Maybe with some foreshadowing there? I normally check if there'll be enough space to get my soldering iron in between components that might need to change. Or if I can get my fingers in to press buttons and if components will fit in the intended housing. I wanted to mention my intended design because I'm very proud it works, even though I had no idea what I was doing. Having Wi-Fi wasn't critical for this project, so it seemed like a good opportunity to experiment and learn more about RF design. The main thing I learned was that it's all basically black magic, but luckily I'm black. Armed with my new knowledge and overconfidence, I started designing. The ESP hardware design guide and chip antenna data sheet had component value recommendations for the matching circuit, which I used. As I started doing the antenna layout, I realized there was no way the reference designs would fit on my board, so I needed to create my own. The chip antenna needed to be placed on the corner of the PCB, and I tried to put all the matching components as close to the reference designs as I could. Then I connected them with a curvy feed line, because real feed lines have curves. It's supposed to have 50 ohm impedance, so I needed the specs of the PCB to be able to calculate it, which were all available on NextPCB's website. I plugged the values into a coplanar waveguide calculator, then adjusted the track width and gap width to get the desired impedance. I tried a few calculators and got slightly different results, but I thought they were close enough. I put a cute little via fence around the antenna, which should help with any interference. The final thing I did was to remove the solder mask from the feed line. I thought this would make it look cooler, and it absolutely did. It's almost certainly a bad design choice though, so I wouldn't recommend it unless you want your boards to look cooler. Unfortunately, I don't have the required equipment to properly test the RF performance of my antenna. All I could do was test the Wi-Fi signal strength with my phone and compare it to an ESP32 C3 Super Mini. To my surprise, it actually had better signal than the Super Mini, so I was very pleased with the result. The heating elements were very simple to design in comparison to the control board. It consists of an NTC thermistor, connectors and integrated heating element. The boards need to fit flush against the side of the vat, so I didn't want any through hole components. I put in some pads in addition to the connector footprints, so I could easily solder wires to them if I decided against using the connectors. There's a connector on each end, so that I can chain the boards to have two in parallel, one on either side of the vat for more even heat dissipation. I put the heating element on the bottom layer as it would be the side next to the vat, so it will allow for the best heat transfer. To create the heating element, I simply routed the trace back and forth across the entire back of the PCB, then connected it to the top power rails with quite a few veers, as there will be a significant current. The resistance of the trace depends on the copper thickness, length and width. I planned on using 0.018mm thick, or 0.5 ounce copper, with a length of 2 meters. I plugged the values into a trace resistance calculator, and found that it would need to be 0.4mm wide, to get the desired resistance of 5 ohms. In theory, creating the heating element was very simple. However, in practice, I'm an idiot and ordered the wrong copper thickness. I used 0.35mm, or 1 ounce copper, so the resistance was half what I calculated. Luckily, this didn't really affect any result though. I planned on using a 12 volt power supply, which would have allowed a 5 ohm heating element to draw a maximum of 28.8 watts. Two in parallel would have half the resistance, so it could draw double the amount of power. As my heating element had half the intended resistance, I ended up with a potential maximum of 115.2 watts. However, in code, I limited this to an average of 15 watts. Next PCB asked me to take a look at their HQ DFM software, show you guys and give my thoughts on it. It's a PCB design for manufacture and assembly analysis tool. It helps review PCB design files, forms automatic checks and saves time. You can view Gerber files for general inspection or run automatic tests that will highlight mistakes and show potential issues. You don't have to manually check each element meets all the design rules for a given manufacturer. The default design rules are based on industry standards and not a specific manufacturer but they can be adjusted in the rule management menu. It generates a report which summarizes the PCB layout, gives notes about features that can affect the manufacturing costs and yields. The recommendations are based on years of industry experience and IPC guidelines. Another useful feature is the integrated BOM and Centroid file checker with footprint verification against HQDFM's built-in component library. These help catch errors with part placement on the PCB and issues with footprints not matching the physical components. There's even a built-in impedance calculator. It's a free tool you can download from NextPCB's website, so go and check it out. There's a link in the description. After verifying my design, I went to order the PCBs. Ordering PCBs from NextPCB is quick and easy. Just go to the website, 
click PCB quote and upload your Gerber files. You'll see a preview of the PCB and can inspect it further with the online Gerber viewer if you want to. Next, just select the PCB parameters you want, like the PCB thickness, copper weights, solder mask and silk screen colours. You can then add it to your cart and check out. They also provide assembly services where you'll need to upload the Centroid and BOM files. It will show you a list of the match components and details. They currently have a promotion for your first PCB order free. They also have a free PCB assembly offer. When I ordered the PCBs for this project, I was notified that there was an issue with a capacitor and USB port footprint. I was very impressed they reviewed the files so thoroughly and even gave suggestions on how to resolve the issues. I received some pictures of the first PCB for me to check and improve before the rest were assembled. The whole process was pretty quick and I was kept updated with progress. When I received the package and opened it, they included a nice PCB ruler which demonstrates their capabilities. I was also surprised to see they had included the spare unused components which were a nice bonus. The bare heating element PCBs came stacked together. The assembled wards were packaged individually in anti-static bags and bowl wrap. I wasn't 100% sure exactly how I was going to get everything connected to the boards, so I didn't get the header pins or power jack soldered on for me. In the end I used header pins for the heater and probe and soldered the ribbon cable directly between the board and display. I used SMB components for the heating element PCBs. There were only a couple of pads that needed soldering, so I didn't bother getting stencils. I applied the solder paste directly from the syringe and placed the components. I then used hot air on the underside of the board to reflow the solder. I designed the case for my control board in FreeCAD. I can't say there's really anything interesting about the design. It was just a simple case to hold everything in place and protect the components. I exported the parts as STLs then slice them in Cura for 3D printing. Assembling the casing was almost easy. Remember that foreshadowing from earlier? One of the electrolytic capacitors was too tall and pressing it against one of the mounting screw heads for the display. The lazy solution was just to remove that screw. The display isn't going anywhere with the other three screws still holding it in. The other side of the casing can then be screwed on and finally the encoder knob is just a press fit. Both the heat elements just get plugged in. Now let's check it works. That looks promising. To have this all inside the printer, I need to run the power wires through the fan wire hole, like I did for my previous version. This time I wanted to be a much cleaner version, so I decided to drill a hole in the back panel to mount the barrel jack for the heater's power input. I used thermal tape to attach the heating element to either side of the vat. Now a little bit about the code. My control board uses an ESP32 C3 microcontroller, which I can program with the Arduino IDE in C++. I based the code for my original version and added all the new features. I'm still using a Bang Bang controller as it's been working perfectly well so far. I did modify it slightly to work in an interrupt service routine. This is because the e-ink display is very slow to update. It takes about 650 milliseconds, which was too long to block the control loop for. I basically declared all the variables as volatile and changed all the floats to doubles. Was this the best way to solve the problem? Almost certainly not. But did it work? Also no. So I did some rubber duck debugging with AI. So, as you can see, the code isn't working properly. If you just figure out what's wrong with this section and uh, fix it for me, that'd be great. Um, oh, and here's a ChatGPT window to help you. I'll be back in a bit. I noticed there was an issue with rotary encoder, sometimes registering the wrong direction. This gave some bad debounce vibes. So I got up my oscilloscope to probe it. And sure enough, the signal was bouncing more than a snake on a trampoline. It always seemed to settle within 20 microseconds, 
So I slapped a 20 microsecond delay in the code before reading the pin states. This was inside an interrupt service routine, so as you know, it's always a great idea to put delays in them. While I had my oscilloscope out, I thought I would check the signals to make sure they looked okay, which I did, and checked the PWM was now in fact the 25 kilohertz I set it to, which it was. While I don't think this is a particularly risky device, I did consider the safety of it. It requires a button press to initially start the heater, so in the event the microcontroller restarts, either due to crashing or power loss, it will not turn the heater on. If the thermistor gets disconnected, the heating element is switched off and an error message is displayed. There's a timeout, so it'll automatically switch off the heater if you forget to turn it off. I set current and power limits based on the element's resistance. These should limit the maximum achievable temperature in the event the thermal regulation fails for some reason. If the input voltage drops below the threshold, then the heating element will be turned off and an error message will be displayed until an appropriate input voltage has been restored. The main reason for this was to prevent it from trying to draw power from the USB port. With the basic functionality done, I had to choose how I wanted the program to operate. My priorities were to have it be quick and easy to use. I thought the best way to achieve this would be to have a default target temperature and timeout that could be adjusted before the heater is started or changed on the fly while it's running. This means you'll need one button press to start the heater if you don't change the defaults. I set up my thermal camera to see the vat heating up and how the heat spreads to the resin. I should point out that the temperature scale of the thermal camera is dynamic, so the colours of the whole scene change as the element heats up. This was recorded inside where the ambient temperature is about 22 degrees C. The heater is set to 35 degrees, so there isn't a drastic difference in temperature as the camera might imply. After about 20 minutes of letting it heat up, I gave the resin a stir and started my calibration for inside prepared. I think all the prints came out just about as well as I could have possibly hoped for. One issue I could not figure out was some odd behaviour with the USB serial port. I do not believe this is a problem with my design because I never make mistakes. No, because the behaviour is consistent and reproducible and the electrical signals all looked fine on my oscilloscope. If the board is off and then connected, the USB works as expected. Except when I try to program it. If I hold the boot button and press the reset to force it into the USB download mode, the board seems to enter the mode, but the serial connection stops working. The way I found to get it into USB download mode with a working connection was to hold down the boot button while plugging in the USB. I tested uploading the code on an ESP32C3 Super Mini as it uses the same microcontroller and it uploaded via the USB without any issues. So that should mean it's not an issue with the IDE settings or code. I have no idea what's causing the issue so if you have any ideas, please let me know. Leading on from my uploading issues, the ink display actually caused a problem because the reset connection was pulling GPIO2 low, stopping the ESP from being programmed. This was an easy fix though, I just swapped reset with the chip select lines and that solved the problem. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments. And thanks again to Next Piece for sponsoring this video. I'll have a link to their website and the HQDFM software in the description, so go and check them out. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.